Kumusta sa inyo lahat? How are you all doing? My name is Francis Mendoza, and I go by he, they, sila pronouns. I'm the manager of community development here at the Children in Nature Network. So glad that you all are here. Welcome back to welcome to our back to school with nature, supporting social emotional learning and academic outcomes event, a part of our families together in nature series. This initiative provides both inspiration and practical tips for getting more outdoor activities onto the family calendar and more of nature's benefits into the lives of our children. Throughout the year, we'll be offering more families together in nature events, resources, and uh, we just wrapped up the vitamin N challenge in August. And we'll be highlighting family programs and leaders in the children and nature movement. I'm joining you from the land and waters of the Wintu, Pitt River, and Yana peoples in so-called Redding, California. I spoke to you all in my native Tagalog, which is an amalgamation of Tagailog from the Philippines. Um, it's people from the river uh, is what it means. So I feel honored to be on the land and drink from the water of the indigenous peoples here on Turtle Island. We invite you to share the native land you're on in the chat and recognize the joy, healing, and genocide that indigenous peoples have endured who are still here and still thriving since colonization. If you're not familiar with the history of your location, you can learn about indigenous territories and lands with a native land map that we're sharing a link in the chat. We encourage you to learn about the whose indigenous lands you're on, but also normalize land acknowledgements and go beyond them as well. Educate yourself on indigenous issues, amplify um, social media, um, we share uh, so that um, Indigenous um, folks' contemporary uh, issues are shared with others, and then support Indigenous causes and businesses. Before we get started, I'm going to go over some uh, other event logistics. So the closed captioning will be enabled. You can click on that on the bottom um, of your screen, your Zoom screen. You can also use the question and answer uh, button for for questions uh, for any of our panelists. And also the chat is enabled for all attendees, so feel free to comment. Okay, it's now my pleasure to welcome and introduce our speakers. Jose Gonzalez is the founder of Latino Outdoors and co-founder of The Outdoors Oath. He's a professional educator with training in the fields of education and conservation while engaging in different artistic endeavors with art and messaging, often exploring the intersection of the environment and culture. As a partner in the Avarna Group and through his own consulting, his work focuses on equity and inclusion frameworks and practices in the environmental, outdoor, and conservation fields. He's also an illustrator and science communicator. He received his BA at the University of California, Davis, and his MS at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment. Welcome, Jose, if you'd like to offer your pronouns um, and where you're calling from. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Francis. And it's, uh, saludos, everyone. Greetings from Pacific uh, Coast time zone. Uh, I normally live and reside and play in the traditional ancestral stolen occupied unceded lands of the Nisenan, Southern Maidu. Uh, Miwok, among many others, uh, what is presently Sacramento, California, Sacristan Califas. Uh, he, him, they'll respond to any of their respect. And I got to get Francis to read my intros more often. What you going to say? Our next panelist is uh, Kathy Jordan. Dr. Kathy Jordan is the Consulting Director of Research for the Children and Nature Network and directs the leadership development and sustainability education activities at the Institute on the Environment at the University of Minnesota, where she is also a professor of pediatrics in the medical school. At the Children and Nature Network, Kathy developed and oversees the research library and the monthly research digest. She works with CNNN staff to activate the research to inform policy and practice in communities. Kathy's research focuses on the developmental learning and educational outcomes of nature-based learning and approaches to teach approaches to teacher professional development and nature-based learning. Welcome, Kathy. Hi, everyone. 
I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm uh, in Minneapolis today where I live. Um, and uh, this is the traditional and contemporary unceded land of the Dakota. Thank you, Kathy. As you might have noted in the chat, you can uh, now enable um, uh, yourself to put in your uh, where you're calling from. And last but not least, um, I'd like to welcome Sheila, Sheila Williams Ridge. She's the director of the Child Development Laboratory School at the University of Minnesota and an instructor for the Institute of Child Development. Her work focuses on early childhood environmental education and nature based learning. She serves on the governing boards for the Natural Start Alliance, the Minneapolis Nature Preschool, Dodge Nature Center, Monarch Joint Venture, and St. Paul City School. Oh, is there anything you don't do, Sheila? Oh, my goodness. Sheila has a BA in biology, an MA in education, and an ED in educational leadership. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you so much, Francis. It's wonderful to be here. I am also in Minneapolis uh, with Kathy Jordan, so on the unceded lands of the Dakota people. And I'm so glad to be joining you here. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm excited to get us started today. As, as we come in with all these wonderful um, people attending the webinar, thank you again for um, putting that in the chat where you're coming from, the indigenous lands you're on. Um, we want to really um, ask how the transition from summer time has been into the school year. And for many of us, the school year starts in August to September. And how can parents support the work that you're doing? Um, how involved should you be um, and how ways to engage in, in, in that work. Um, so we're going to really go into the how, into the what um, and the why and then the how of how all those questions can be answered. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask um, Sheila, we, we have some um, slides coming up here, um, if you'd like to introduce some of these slides, but also just O overarching how how you could extend the benefits of outdoor time in the summer to the school year as well. Yes, I, I know that families are very excited for the back to school time right now. It's an exciting time of year, um, but can also be filled with all these expectations of what ha will happen at school, what children will be experiencing, and if children are going to feel uh, ready and supported in their learning. And I really think about, um, you know, school as an extension of what families' goals are and how we can work in partnership to really extend the learning that children have been doing all summer and that in the summer, it extends the learning that's happened um, during the school year. So I work generally with, uh, with teachers of young children and with young children between zero and five. And there are so many exciting things that they've probably been up to this summer. So we're excited to welcome them back. Uh, in early childhood, a lot, we focus on social and emotional learning. And that is really because it sets the foundation to children being comfortable um, and safe, but also challenged and, and ready to learn. And so we want to do that in partnership with families. I'm sharing a few slides today. Uh, we know that like living uh, in a pandemic and numbers are changing and and surging again and with the effects of climate change impacting uh, both our summer activities but now more so also our school year activities um, there's also social and economic turbulence and these things can cause stress and worry and uncertainty for families so we really want to make sure that schools um, supply a foundation and, and a level of support uh, that children and families can count on. And we know that moments in nature, uh, like you can see in these photos, really help children understand uh, their own growing feelings, their own self-identity, and what they like and what they're ready for. They, we know that you know young children and, and all of us are really discovering themselves, um, and we want them to do that in safe and supportive environments. Uh, we know that giving children opportunities to take risks um, and to you know understand their feelings and things that they like, right? I like climbing, um, or I you know don't want to climb, or this feels scary for me right now, or I can't do this. Uh, we want to offer them opportunities that they can learn and grow, and we also want to allow them enough time to explore those emotions and help them 
give words to it. For very young children, sometimes they have a feeling of frustration or anxiety that they don't even have the vocabulary to um, to express yet. And that learning how to appropriately express your emotions uh, is a big part of going to school and also to make yourself heard and to learn to advocate for yourself um, as well as advocate for others. We also want children to be able to advocate for the world around them. Um, and so we we really want to support teachers and 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 families and thinking about what can children already do? What are they ready to be pushed to do? And uh, and what does that support look like? So we are really thinking about these lifelong skills that, that children will have when we're thinking about their experiences in nature. And, uh, and how do we uh, support children as they try things and perhaps fail um, and try again? And what does that resiliency looks like? or what that resilience looks like. Uh, we also want them to see each other and themselves as experts and as learners, uh, because we know that that's a really important foundational skill to be able to see yourself as a continuous learner um, and to know that they are always safe and cared for in their environments. So um, so we are, um, so on the next, uh, on this slide, um, I just uh, put a couple of photos about opportunities um, that nature really provides for children to be able to explore together um, for imaginative play. Um, the children in the photo on the left, they named this place uh, Mummy Island. I think it sounded a little bit mysterious and, and a little bit scary. And they, um, they had a wonderful time trying to get to the island, um, crossing through some water that was like three inches deep. It wasn't very deep, but it was a, an adventure for them. And it was something that they worked towards throughout the summer. Um, but also, you know, pictures like on the right, where children can have solitary time to do things and just pick raspberries and taste it and be present. Uh, we want children and families to see nature as a space that they can go to and, and relax. And so it is really helping to support uh, their overall development, but also their social and emotional well-being, their mental health wellness, um, as well as set those precursors for uh, for deeper academic learning. And we know that, you know, moments together or when you have time alone are really important for our um, ways that we start to identify themselves. And then on the next slide, I just have a few photos because uh, although we are in summer right now uh, in Minnesota, we know that winter will be here soon enough. And to remember that there are opportunities for children to learn and explore. And that is really kind of the deep, like, what of this work is that those times in nature can happen throughout the year and that children can learn about like new rules and new skills and and behaviors around being prepared for the outdoors and being resilient and being cooperative um, taking turns and working together and problem solving they're resolving conflicts there are so many things that children can learn throughout the year by uh, enjoying time outside together and this is really the foundation for the work of um, having children spend time in nature. So we're going to get into a little bit more of some of the supportive parts of uh, the research and what that has focused on. But I just wanted to kind of set the stage and thinking about what is uh, what is the goal? What are we hoping that children will will learn in these moments? Mm, my, I want to go to Mommy Island now. And uh, hopefully, Minnesota won't be so hot and you can channel all that snow energy in that last slide. But we really wanna focus now on what the research says and um, how does nature support mental health, social emotional learning, cognitive function, and then academic outcomes and how they all intersect. It's a very loaded question and I'm gonna ask um, Kathy um, to share what she has with her slides as well. Great, okay, thanks Francis. You can go to the next slide, please. So some of this research is about passive exposure to nature. Um, in a number of studies, the greener the school's surroundings, the better the standardized test scores of the students, even after you control for poverty and all sorts of other factors. And studies of students who have classroom views out onto green space show the same findings. So some recent studies add some nuance to these findings. Um, an author named Sivaraja uh, found that the amount of trees surrounding Toronto schools 
correlated with sixth graders' academic achievement, but much more strongly for schools with more disadvantaged students compared to students with more or schools with more advantaged students. And a colleague of mine, Ming Kuo, showed that not only do disadvantaged students benefit relatively more from trees around their schools, those same students who have the most to gain from schoolyard greenery had the least opportunity to experience exposure to greenery. Economically advantaged students tend to get the greenest schoolyards. Next slide, please. So that was about passive exposure to greenery around schools. What about active engagement with nature through nature-based learning? So nature-based learning is on average more effective than traditional instruction. The research in this area is getting more sophisticated and this finding is holding across diverse student populations, academic subjects, instructors, instructional approaches, um, educational settings and research designs. And all of that gives us confidence that what we're seeing is real. And when I talk about nature-based learning, I'm not talking about environmental education, learning about the environment. I'm talking about learning across the curriculum, math and science and you know, language and social studies, et cetera, in nature and through nature. Next slide, please. So why does nature help kids learn? We've learned that both the nature itself, how green and the instruction or the pedagogical approaches characteristic of nature-based learning contribute to its advantages over traditional teaching. And there are a number of theories about why nature itself might be uh, helpful um, to, to students in, um, in how they learn. Um, even in passive exposure, um, we can get these effects in cognitive and social emotional outcomes that then go on to affect how kids learn and how they do in school. So one is called attention restoration theory proposed by Kaplan and Kaplan. And ART suggests that there are two systems of attention. There's the effortful attention, like when you just really have to focus hard on, for kids, it might be classwork or studying at home. And then there's the effortless attention, like when you're, you're just taking in your surroundings and you're not really concentrating on anything in particular. Attention restoration theory suggests that that effortful attention system gets tired and then we lose focus. Nature experiences invoke that effort, effortless uh, attention and give the directed attention system some respite so that you can come back cognitively restored to whatever the next effortful task is that you need to do. A number of studies that looked at attention restoration theory through studying walks in nature versus walks in more of a built or an urban environment were the first to show that attention improves after time in nature and not when you are spending time in the more built environment. In an early walk in nature study, um, again, my colleagues Faber Taylor and Quo uh, saw that the effect was quite large. It was equivalent to the dose of taking uh, one dose of methylphenidate, a medication that we use for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So students who have exposure to nature during the school day, even just nature or having a nature break, and certainly also by learning outdoors, are likely to be able to pay better attention. And when kids pay better attention, they learn and remember better. Next slide, please. Another theory is the stress reduction theory proposed by Ulrich. And that suggests that nature has a physiological impact on us by reducing stress levels. High stress can disrupt learning on its own, um, but also at least partly because high stress interferes with paying attention. So the physiological and the, the cognitive interact. Lee and Sullivan did an experiment with high school students, um, randomly assigning them to a classroom with no window, a view out to sort of a barren view, like a brick wall, and then out onto a green burden view. And after students did something moderately stressful, like having to do public speaking or mental arithmetic in front of a group, they then took a break in that setting of either a classroom with no window, a green view, or a barren view. And the students who had a green view recovered from that stressful activity more quickly than students who had a barren view or no window. So that was passive exposure. Studies, studies of children actively participating in nature-based learning make that point even more clearly, I think. Detweiler studied fifth grade students in Germany who participated in forest school one day a week. So they were outdoors, let's say like every Friday, 
and they were learning across the curriculum in a forest setting. And then there was a control group who didn't have that experience. The kids in the forest school showed a normal healthy pattern of cortisol, a hormone that's released under stress. The control group didn't. So yay for forest school uh, experiences, but this study also gives us some pause because it's worrisome that the regular indoor classroom might be detrimental to normal physiological function. So students exposed to or learning in the context of nature may be less chronically stressed. Higher stress levels can interfere with attention and therefore learning, and lower stress levels are gonna be more conducive to learning. Next slide, please. So what is it about the pedagogical approach that might be important? In the formal school setting, we know that educational research, not necessarily related to nature-based learning specifically, we learn from that, that literature that approaches that are active, hands-on, collaborative, inquiry-based, these tend to be the most effective, even when they're done indoors. These happen to be the active ingredients of the nature-based learning approach and are likely part of why learning, nature, learning through nature-based instruction is particularly effective. Also, nature experiences uh, that are challenging or involve some developmentally appropriate risk, like Sheila was showing you slides of, of Mummy Island, like walking across three inches of water for a preschooler might be you know, a little bit risky or a little bit challenging. These sorts of experiences help kids become more resilient and learn skills like cooperation and communication, problem solving, leadership and followership skills, and these social emotional learning outcomes can also contribute to successful functioning in school. Next slide. So studies of exposure to greenery around schools is related to better learning and academic outcomes, possibly because nature improves cognitive functions like attention and emotional functions like stress reactivity, among its many other benefits. And active nature-based learning adds high impact teaching practices to those cognitive and emotional effects that support learning. We're also seeing that sometimes that relationship between nature exposure or nature engagement and student outcomes um, is relatively stronger for children from less advantaged backgrounds, something called the equigenic effect. Nature is good for everyone, but especially good for those who are from less advantaged backgrounds. I think we're going to see that this effect is particularly important for children who might have relatively less exposure to quality green greenery and uh, nature-based educational programming because of socioeconomic disadvantage. So creating more equitable access to nature combined with this equigenic effect could begin to narrow the gaps in achievement between the more and the less advantaged students. So I hope that's been a little bit of a, a primer on what the research tells us about the relationship between our nature's impact on the cognitive and the emotional and how those go on to then influence learning and academic outcomes. I'll pass it back to Francis. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, the equigenic effect is something that I really um, uh, incorporated into my own work, being a former park ranger and naturalist and, uh, and educator um, and going to Jose now, I'm just going to ask how that sort of shows up in the work that you have been involved with as an educator, as a school administrator, um, in, in you know finding innovative ways to get um, people out into nature, uh, and also um, you know doing so equitably so that um, everybody can enjoy it. So, pose that question to you, Jose, and uh, let you take the next slides as well. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. Uh, and I've got, I've got a couple of visuals mostly to guide the conversation, knowing that we'll engage a little bit more in Q&A. But I really want to uh, compliment to what Sheila and Kathy have shared and kind of amplify some of those elements, um, starting off by my kind of professional entry into the spaces as a teacher. So I trained to be a teacher uh, from college. And because I really saw that education could be that way to both still be of service to the community and really look at how do we support uh, right, the skills uh, for advancement that I myself as, a, as an immigrant kid from Mexico felt like, hey, this is providing opportunities. The great element to that though, is that um, pictured here, this is me in college, the, uh, I, my training to be a teacher was through a program that supported migrant uh, students. 
And so when we talk about kind of the, the role of quote unquote culture and specifically kind of a, uh, both an uh, ethnic and community uh, level type of culture, because culture exists all around, science has a culture, uh, a lot of professions that we have is a culture. But what I want to label here is it was a great entry for me to really kind of see the complementary power of culture, meaning are there others like me uh, that come from uh, similar lived experience that have grown up uh, with some of these different factors and elements that also contribute uh, both to our social emotional well-being, but also, of course, how that helps us uh, academically. Um, lots of, uh, you know, I can turn to Kathy and be able to, that she could probably point the, a lot of the studies that say when you ask, uh, especially in the sciences, people would ask, you know, draw me a scientist. What do they look like? Um, there's a whole um, body of work that shows that for a lot of students, for some, they might see themselves easily representative of that, and they'll draw pictures like themselves, but for others, um, they won't. And so a, what a scientist looks like um, would be very different than their own background. And so I share this because for me, my teaching education program had an outdoor education program. And so here we are as the outdoor uh, instructors out um, teaching in and about the outdoors, uh, but to migrant students, so four, fifth, and sixth grade migrant students were pre predominantly English language learners, predominantly of a Latina background. Um, most of them were immigrants in some in some way as well. And so here are all these students. But for me, here's the experience: the students look like me, how I was growing up, and here we are looking like uh, the students. So highly culturally relevant from the start. And going through that really for me was able to look at, to be able to say, hey, uh, next slide. When we then support these experiences of nature, we know that there are um, academic benefits. We know um, the value in terms of skill development or social emotional learning and culture plays a role in that. Because when we support and nurture that, um, and in a way kind of make it normative in terms of that nature is for all, it allows us to better in, um, close those equity gaps, which can sometimes show up later. And in terms of like, well, you know, I like nature too, but do I see myself represented out there? Uh, if I go out on the trail, will I get looks in terms of to say that you fit and belong as well? That sense of belonging um, which can be really grounded in culture, plays a role because it can be a factor that then um, can permeate or perpetuate this idea, oh, well, that's not for me. And so even though we know we, all of these benefits of nature are there, um, it can inadvertently or deliberately be another barrier that, that is set up in place. Uh, so next slide. And so... Providing you know, nature-based experiences, outdoor experience, uh, experiential uh, experience in the outdoors. Uh, I often look like the outdoors in terms of the land, in terms of nature, is one of the best learning environments. It's not the best, but that's, that's, my, <laughs> that's my opinion in there. Because, uh, as was mentioned, it provides a starting, um, a starting platform that has all this complexity that we were adapted to. As humans, we've evolved in this relationship. Um, and so provides the complexity, which isn't taxing, uh, as Kathy said, it isn't the one that is extractively kind of taking all directed attention, but it has complexity for engagement. And so it provides those opportunities um, to practice critical, for me, practice the critical, critical skills that are useful in school, and at, uh, as well as things that we know are valuable, but sometimes uh, begin to disappear in quote-unquote traditional schools. So for example, play, recess, the ability to kind of engage in some of these joyful elements, um, which are in, uh, critical skills for how we relate to each other. So I often say, right, we need to be able to think about how we've related to joy with each other as opposed to these extreme, uh, as opposed to relating with extreme othering. 
I said, next slide. And so for me, to that point, if I know that uh, nature provides these benefits in terms of, quote unquote, leveling the playing field for academic benefit, um, that it provides a lot of the complexity and opportunity for skill development. I also want to leverage it in a way that invites um, the lived experience and really kind of the cultural markers of a family, of a community, so that they see themselves not just represented, but also contributing to those elements. Because ultimately, um, that has to play a role, not just in receiving the benefits of these uh, natural spaces, but in the care and protection and stewardship. Right, let's be able to say a lot of, for example, um, take for example that a lot of, for example, immigrant Latina moms care about their kids' education, so they will always do their best to support the school, to show up in the way to do that. And so, if I can, rec you know, let people know, hey, this park is also part of the school, then we begin to care for it and protect it um, uh, as much as well. But also at the end of the day that we're able to, for me, provide these opportunities that not only benefit the students, but both the students and the parents and provide uh, some of that intergenerational weaving um, that sometimes uh, may inadvertently uh, get lost. And the kids may benefit from all these experiences, but sometimes we we'll say parents will say, great, when do we also get to go? Um, and so those are opportunities in that way. And then I think I might have one last slide here. I don't know. That was my last one. So uh, I'll continue on for the next uh, in discussion to kind of say, what are some of those activities that um, I recommend for practitioners or for teachers uh, or for parents as well when we're out in the outdoors that are both uh, simple enough but powerful enough and that also provide the opportunities not just for the academic and skill development, uh, but also kind of for me, um, an opportunity for the windows into the culture of both families and students. So I'll pass it back. Thank you, Jose. Love the picture there. Just having whole family engagement is one of the Children in Nature Network's mantras and ensuring elders and youth are really helping to, not, I mean, the research shows it's not just um, children learning from adults, but adults learning from their children as well. So it goes both ways. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, uh, Latino Outdoors, who uh, Jose founded, is having its 10th anniversary this year. Hispanic Heritage Month is coming up uh, from September 15th to October 15th. And uh, maybe you can speak a little bit on that. As somebody in, <laughs> in the chat, um, I think it was Ezekiel, mentioned the America's Latino um, Eco Festival coming in uh, Colorado as well. So would you like to speak a little on that? Uh, just briefly, I, I think, uh... There's an expression in Spanish that we say, la cultura cura, right? Like nature cures or nature heals. Uh, I'm sorry, culture cures <laughs> and culture heals. But to weave nature as part of that, to not forget that element. And so with Latino Outdoors, it began with that question to say, where are there others like me? So there's that cultural leaning. And then how do we create those spaces of community um, that provide, um, in this case, those opportunities for connecting people to people, people to place, people to the process, how do we go out and engage with nature, with the outdoors, all the benefits, and people to policy to ensure that we're kind of connected to, to the care and stewardship of these places. So I'm really excited, and, and thank you, Francis, because 10 years, um, so as we say, si se puede, pero hazlo. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to um, go to the next slide and ask Sheila how what are ways to support inquiry, both academic outcomes and social emotional learning? You know, we've been sort of highlighting a lot of the different um, uh, evidence-based research that shows it works, but how, what are ways to support that and um, uh, really focus on the child development as we do our programs and our um, camps and all the different things that uh, many of our uh, constituents are a part of? 
Yeah, thank you so much. And I've been just reflecting on the things that Jose and Kathy have been saying, right? Those high impact teaching practices and, and those things that all educators can do, whether you're, you know, the family at home or a professional educator or in a formal or informal environment, those things that are, like Jose said, simple and powerful. What does that look like? And so I just highlighted a couple of photos. This is one and it is just an opportunity for children to take perspective. So there, um, there's a lot happening in this one small photos, but um, there are some children that are climbing on top of a log that is about four feet off of the ground. And for some children, that perspective is is enough and, and that can be a challenge for them. And so we're offering them both a safe challenge, but also an opportunity to try something new, to see that, you know, I'm afraid of this, you are, you know, good at this. But also if you see in the background, there um, are other people on top of that bridge and giving children an opportunity to take big perspectives and little perspectives is really, really wonderful. Uh, we had walked over that bridge the day before, and one of the children, the one in the green shirt here said, remember when we were up there and we saw a class down here? And they, and I said, yeah, they, you know, I remember that yesterday. And he said, do you think that we look small to them? And I was like, yes, right? Like you were really starting to understand this. And all we were doing was, you know, watching people on top of a bridge and, and waving to them. So those kind of high impact things, asking questions, digging into that inquiry, letting children take a little bit of risk, um, but also really fall in love with learning. And I think that that can be done by asking well-crafted questions about like, what do you notice? What do you wonder? What are you thinking about? Um, and giving them, you know, opportunities to try new things. So next Next slide. And also giving children opportunities. Um, someone in the chat just talked about um, advocating and, and caring for the environment, giving children opportunities to do that both uh, locally in kind of play areas. So you can see here on the left, one of our classrooms does a lot of gardening with their toddlers. So these are children between 16 and 30 months who are really digging into how they can care for the environment. It doesn't have to be a very big space. Um, and, you know, plant things that are resilient, uh, hopefully things that are native grown to your space um, or that can really take whatever, you know, your elements are, um, but giving children opportunities to engage with soil and with plants and with animals nearby. Um, but also like you can see on the photo on the left, giving op children opportunities to see themselves in nature. So uh, collaboration with other people, um, giving children opportunities to, to be represented and also contributing. And so when we are out there paddling, uh, I like that Jose and I both showed pictures of paddling with very young children uh, because it's such a wonderful thing. And children notice um, you know, who's living in the water, why we take care of water, um, what things we can do. If we pass trash, we pick it up and we talk about like how we can keep trash out of there. So um, I have been working on a, a guide with some uh, some of my colleagues and it's called the Environmental Kinship Guide. I think we'll put a, a link in the chat in a little while um, where we can really think about those ways that children are growing in their kinship to nature. And this can happen at home or in schools, but wherever it is happening, we want to make sure that we are noticing that that is really important development for young children, as well as kind of cognitive, um, other cognitive tasks. And then the next picture, um, just uh, the next slide, please. Yes. And then just giving children opportunities to connect with other than human species. So whether that's plants or our animals, um, this preschool has a farm on site and they talk about the relationship between uh, people and animals. And, you know, there's complex relationships, but they dig into that. And so this is a, a photo of children having an opportunity to do that. And then the last slide, uh, I just want to you know, promote opportunities for children to just have fun, to experience joy. Um, these two children are just eating their way through a snow mound um, and having a great time. Finding joy um, in learning, finding joy in nature, but also just lowering your anxiety and stress and smiling and laughing. Those are powerful things that we all need in our lives all of the time. 
and also having opportunities for children to have a, a sense of belonging in the space and seeing themselves just joyously enjoying uh, the environment. And so I hope that adults can model that type of behavior by getting out there um, and showing joy uh, in being outside year round, whatever your whatever your local uh, ecosystem may be, there are always joyous things. I grew up in the desert and I loved playing in the desert as a child. There are so many ways to really engage with that. And I also wanted to say, so this is a picture of when uh, my children were younger and they're older. And there are many schools in our area as um, your children leave early childhood and go into um, elementary school or middle school or high school, there are schools that are doing wonderful things across the country. Um, I know several classrooms who are doing Forest Fridays, and I think someone mentioned something like this in the chat, um, and that can be any grade where they spend most or all of their Fridays outdoors. Uh, and we are really excited about the opportunities that this is providing for children. Some, you know, some places places call it Wilderness Wednesdays, depending on the day that works best for their school system. But we hope that that every school and every child has opportunities to engage. So there are things that you can do uh, in your environment locally every day to really get children engaged. So uh, these are just a couple of examples and I look forward to questions and dialogue. Thank you so much, Sheila. What, what a wonderful uh, suite of resources you provided in the chat. Make sure you are able to click on the links that um, um, Sheila has there, and my my kids uh, are eighteen and seventeen now. But back back in the day, I was uh, remember you know doing a program called Coyote Clubs, which you know of course is not uh, correct in terms of uh, phylogenetic. It's Coyote Kits, but we love to alliterate, so we had to keep it Cubs in our park. Um, now that we have everybody uh, on your screen. Uh, we, this is our question and answer session, and we already have a few questions queued up. So one, the first one and, uh, in the chat, um, feel free to um, put in the Q&A section your questions, and uh, we can answer them uh, according to um, uh, the time that is allotted. Leila asks uh, to Jose uh, to please describe what you believe is the best learning environment. Oh, good question. I always hesitate when it's best as if like this is superlative because uh, context, of course, matters. I'm also uh, don't mean to say it's always going to vary because I think there are a couple of factors that both Sheila and Kathy have mentioned that, that I hold very tightly. And so as Kathy mentioned in terms of the Kaplan's and kind of uh, attention restoration, I think of their reasonable person model as well, which is to consider uh, those three factors, their elements are model building, um, the elements of meaningful action, and then the uh, clear headedness or competence. And so for learning environments, the idea there is to how do we create learning environments that bring on the best in people compared to environments that bring out the worst in people. Uh, we're actually really good as humans about creating environments that bring out the worst in people. And so as, uh, not to throw schools under the bus because I'm a product of that, but as Kathy said, oh no, what if we've designed some of our schools that actually aren't great <laughs> for students? Um, and we, uh, we have uh, inadvertently done that in some cases. So I'll wrap it up by thinking about saying, I'm looking for environments that uh, contribute to a sense of meaningful action that when I'm, uh, for kids and for parents that were out there, is what I'm doing, does it, does it have meaning for me? Does it matter? Can I see that it connects to something that's really important to me? Uh, is it supporting my competence? Is it purely through the fact of getting out in nature, receiving those benefits, uh, restoring my directed attention, um, giving me things that I'd be like, this is actually a neat and fun and useful skill to have. Um, and then the model building is really, what kind of common picture is this providing for me in relationship with others? And then lastly, uh, that's a part of this as well is does it provide those elements of intuitive fascination, which is also part of the model um, that gives me, it's a, this space between what's comfortable and familiar, but also curiosity and wonder about what's just beyond that turn, what might be over in those trees. Um, and so it keeps me anchored and grounded in a lot of uh, not just comfort, uh, but 
pushes me into those learning edges, into learning zones without the being alarm, um, alarm zones. Uh, and that's where the context comes in. Because a five-day backpacking experience can be incredibly powerful and transformative. But if you haven't been scaffolded and supported in that, it can be the most terrible experience you can provide a group of kids or a family. And so those are the things that I say, let me consider the spaces and environment that are providing some of that space and connection. Thank you, Jose. Just wanted to point out too that um, the pictures that uh, you had with the kids in the PFDs or uh, personal flotation devices and Sheila, your canoe picture. Kathy, I know that you're a paddler as well. Um, I, I think it's important. I, I remember doing programs with uh, uh, the park as a park ranger and naturalist and the, the, the kid that was the one that was messing around the most or joking around the most, oftentimes was the one that was scared the most. They've never been out on the water and they're really exhibiting it in ways. So instead of punishing them, it's a, a way to really highlight them, make them a helper and um, really do, go into that development side of, of their um, psyche. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you all, being out on the water is uh, a way to, to, to be out in nature, especially when it's hot. And Alexandra asks, how do you help families to come to participate in the outdoor programs throughout the year or when it's raining, when it's hot, um, like for many of you all now? And I'll start with um, Sheila and we can go uh, anyone else who'd like to um, answer the question as well. Sure, thank you. So our program uh, here at the University of Minnesota, we actually moved to a um, almost all outdoor program during COVID because we were in a building that didn't have air filtration. So, uh, and we're in Minnesota, which means that children were outside for about three hours a day um, in a wide variety of temperatures. So I think that some of the really biggest things are making sure that children are safe and comfortable. Um, knowing that comfortable doesn't have to mean 100% comfortable every second, like a little bit of discomfort is okay, but we never want children to be unsafe. So having gear available, having a robust gear library, if you're going to be a program taking children out in different temperatures, or um, if you're at home, if you need any suggestions, you should email me. I have my favorite mittens um, and wool socks, never cotton, all that good stuff. But I also grew up in Las Vegas, so I understand the the hot and the humid and um, although it's pretty dry there, but it gets very, very hot. Uh, I think some of the things right now, um, we're really concerned with the air quality and what that is going to do to impacting our, our time outdoors. So we're really trying to load up on those good air quality days and to to think about ways that we can um, navigate the, um, the poor air quality days. And I know that that is impacting programs across the country. And unfortunately, I don't you know, see a way out of that just yet until we really, really dig in and tackle the problems um, that are the root causes of the air quality concerns. So that's another thing. But uh, something that I think we can all do pretty easily as adults is dress for the weather ourselves. So whatever that is, if it's really cold, wear your layers and, and snow pants and mittens and extra, you know, things that you need. If it's really hot, dress to be engaged and, and model that uh, behavior for young children, but also model an understanding of weather as not being good or bad, but that weather just is. And all weather is necessary for something. So we need the rain, we need the cold for the plants to have a rest. We need, you know, those hot days. So those tomatoes can ripen. Like nature knows how to do this and we are a part of nature and we can also do this, but having adults that can model, like I can do this. Um, and sometimes you just got to psych yourself up and be like, I could do it. When I moved here from uh, Nevada, the first winter was pretty tricky. And, uh, and I had to learn a lot about how to get comfortable um, in very, very cold temperatures and very cold days. Um, but you are capable of doing it and um, and it'll be well worth it. Francis, can I add in there? Um, picking up on what Sheila was talking about with the air quality, you know, this is gonna be something that we need to figure out moving forward. This is not just, this is not gonna be the only year that we have, you know, intense air quality issues. Um, so one other thing that I want to point out is that you can also bring nature indoors. You don't always have to go um, outdoors. Um, you can bring in all sorts of um, what we call loose parts, you know, elements of nature that could come indoors for play, 
could come indoors for um, nature-based art activities, um, sand, water, you know, those sorts of things, um, pets, animals in a classroom, tending to indoor gardens, you know, window gardens, those sorts of things, making those um, interactions with plants and animals more mindful and full sensory experiences. Those are all things that can sustain us um, and sustain the children when we can't take them outdoors because of either too hot, too cold, too smoky, um, whatever it might be. So much, Kathy. I think um, it's all, oh, go ahead, Jose. I, I was just going to add since um, this is a, a frame and a tool that, that I have found very useful and um, uh, you can also find it in the um, in the Beatles curriculum from the Lawrence Hall of Science at UC Berkeley. Uh, and that's the, I noticed, I wonder, it reminds me of that can work really well, both outside as well as inside, as Kat is mentioning, if you're bringing a little bit of lichen, if you're bringing in you know, or a, like a lichen or moss covered branch, for example, and all you need is that little kind of uh, lens, magnifying lens, for example, and you get in close and you see a whole nother world that maybe, uh, you know, kids haven't seen yet, or you yourself haven't seen in terms of what's there. Um, and so what I like about the power and simplicity of that is it reminds me of you're asking for observations. And then depending on how you're setting, setting it up, the, you can do, you know, language frames, academic language frames for, for, for that. Ooh, tell me, what do you notice? What observations are, are you, you know, uh, are you making? And even the kids say, well, I see. And then you just re reframe, right? Recast. Great. So what do you observe? Uh, and the ways that you begin to support that. But it's all observation-based. You're supporting those skills. Um, and then I wonder, of course, you're kind of, you're proposing, like, what do, what do you think? Uh, make some guesses. We might even make hypotheses. Uh, and and, and, I, and it reminds me of brings in that familiarity, right? Now you're doing compare and contrast. You're, you're really tapping into that background knowledge. You're assessing maybe what models they're using that might need some correction, but also... Um, you'd be, you know, especially when you're dealing with different cultures, be able to get us like, oh, that's interesting. I would have, you know, I would never have guessed that because I don't come with that lived experience. And they they're also uh, work great because they challenge the narrative that you're supposed to know it all and be an expert as the parent or the teacher. You're supposed to have every answer. And I often say, no, actually what's likely better and more powerful is how do you ask the questions and support the asking of those questions? Because I think sometimes parents hesitate to do that. So like, oh, what if they ask me this? And I, I don't know what it is. Well, support the asking. <laughs> and you'd be like, that's a great question. Looks like we might have to do some some sleuthing or some investigating uh, to, to find out, you know, what's out there. Thank you so much, Jose. I, I had the benefit of going on a hike with you where you em employed the Beatles curriculum and and um you know the, the in the chat it's spelled b e e t l e s but not the the, the band but uh, you can go ahead and click on that from the Lawrence Hall of Science. Um I also wanted to point out that we have about seven minutes. So I want we have a few questions here. I'd like to uh consolidate a few. Uh, Mary Zan and Kirsten asked are there any tips to re-engage older ch children or preteens with nature when there's competition from screens? Um, I'm just gonna combine the two. Um, Marizanne lives in town and doesn't own land where she can take children to in order for them to connect to nature. Any anyone? Um, can, I'll open up to everybody there. If anyone would like to answer that? Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I can start um, and talk a little bit about the the older children and, and the technology issue. Um, it is, I think, a very natural part of development to um, to see sort of higher nature connection when children are younger. It takes a little bit of a dip in adolescence and then it comes back up again as uh, kids get to be young adults. Um, I guess I shouldn't call them kids at that point. Um, and while it's it's natural, you, we, we do want to make sure that, that kids have some ability to sustain a connection to nature. And the things that are going on in that adolescent period um, perhaps can be harnessed in a way that helps kids maintain their connection to nature. So one of the things that's happening is their, their attachments become much more peer-oriented um, and they're spending a lot of their time 
with peers, thinking about peers, worrying about peers, all of those sorts of things. And so social opportunities um, with friends, as opposed to necessarily with family um, or only with family, um, might be one way um, to help kids sustain their connection to nature, finding ways for them to participate, engage with nature with friends. Um, another piece of this is the technology. Um, and, you know, technology is all around us. It does us a lot of good in many ways. It can be overused, but it could also be harnessed to enhance the nature engagement. Um, if they don't want to put their phones down or give them up to go outside, take them with and use some of the, the very cool programs that are about, you know, identifying plants um, or identifying birds from bird calls and, and those sorts of things, um, taking pictures, you know, with your phones, taking, you know, monitoring your experience or documenting your experience through video. You, you can harness these things in a number of ways that, that allow kids to sort of be where they're at developmentally and still be in nature and connecting with nature. Yeah, I'll just add, those are all uh, super wonderful things that older children can do. And I also uh, think that older children really thrive with um, contributing to community and uh, like, like Kathy said, like those social things, but having them um, engage in like community science initiatives or doing real work, um, those things like youth um, in gardens and like youth farming and and opportunities for them to really make a contribution, but also be leaders. So we have um, at Minneapolis Nature Preschool, there are some older children who come and take hikes with the preschoolers in the woods and giving them an opportunity to be leaders in that space, even for just a few hours a week is a really kind of wonderful way to allow them to um, to be supportive and to be a mentor, um, but also to reconnect themselves in those spaces. So I think that those are um, lots, of, there are so many ways that that older children can continue to be an important part of it. And, uh, you know, Kat, just like Kathy said, when they are uh, back to adulthoods, often they, you know, rekindle some of that um, early love and, um, and, get back to doing other things outside, like maybe hiking or camping or paddling. And then they take their own children outdoors because it was important to them. Even if as a yeah. teen, they were like, eh, you know, I'd rather be with my friends. <laughs> um, I would just quickly add to that because I know we're at time. Yes, to the supporting, for example, teens to be the, you know, the mentors, the, the teachers, the disruptors to younger students. Again, there's that meaningful action that you want to um, be able to provide. Uh, and then often we say for intergenerational um, experiences, that's part of what we want to support as well, so that it is mentorship up and down. It, you know, it goes all around. Uh, and then I would just add, quickly add that I think in term, I want to echo that idea of, you know, when we say nature, or even outdoors, to challenge that narrative that it's way out there, that it's far away. While yes, there are structural reasons, you know, think of redlining and the impact that that had uh, in terms of access to nature, uh, urban greening, and so forth. I always want to support this, what I think of it as the spectrum from nearby nature to far away wilderness. Um, and that can include what is the, the, the wild that's right outside your door. And that's what I mean, as Sheila says, change the scale. Now get in really close with the micro adventure and see what's there that you never noticed before. Um, yeah, as well as being able to do a walk around the neighborhood and practice some of the skills that, that you can go out and, and build some of that eco literacy of, of sorts so that nature doesn't just look like this uh, blah of brown and green and because you begin to provide those connecting elements to be like, oh, wow, now I, now I, now I can't unsee an oak. And so given that, how do I build that relationship deeper? Um, and as some of you mentioned, for example, in kinship. Thank you all for those wonderful answers. Um, we are coming up on time. So I just wanted to round it out with um, the last question, if uh, somebody could take that. I'm getting a lot of love on the chat, by the way, from from everybody. Um, uh, so uh, let's see, Nigel uh, asks, he's from the UK, developing a campaign to expand nature connection uh, for children. Any thoughts 
thoughts on how to use arts and science to enhance the benefits of nature connection. So many, I feel like that could be a whole webinar all of itself. I mean, nature, just in front of me, I have all of these like loose parts, like ready to go for the school year. There's so much that can be done. So um, I would say, you know, look at some of the resources that people have shared in the chat. I know I saw Carla here today. She has a wonderful uh, book of resources, the Natural Start Alliance, Children and Nature Network. There are so many wonderful uh, examples of how you can engage. Uh, and then I think earlier, um, the uh, Minnesota Department of Education actually has an outdoor learning resource uh, booklet and uh, a few, maybe eight or so webinars, Kathy's on one of them, um, where they're sharing uh, things on different developmental domains. And so you can dig into that a little bit and find more information on some of those there. Thank you all so much. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. Wonderful to have everybody joining from as far as the UK, I'm sure other places as well. I see a mycelial network in there as well. And I look for future families together in nature uh, webinars. And um, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.